Well, hello and greetings as your new vicar. Um, I have to say when I interviewed and then accepted the offer to become your vicar pre-lockdown, this was not how I anticipated my first Sunday. And obviously the coronavirus has disrupted plans for all of us in these last few months, and we are really unlikely to get back to anything like normal anytime soon. But things are loosening up. I've been talking with David and the church wardens and others to make plans to reopen for Sunday worship. So stay tuned for those details to come. However, in the meantime, I had always planned to spend my first Sunday sharing with you just a little bit about who I am, how this American came to find herself as an ordained minister in the Church of England and ended up as your vicar. So I decided to carry on with that plan in this slightly different format. So today, this is less a sermon, more my story, but I do hope as I introduce myself, you'll be encouraged by the way you hear how God has led and guided my life and often will do the same for you. But first, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us in the midst of all that is happening in our lives, in our country and in the world, in the midst of this pandemic, you are there. As we begin a new chapter in the life and ministry of Raynham and Weddington, we ask that you would guide and direct us, help us to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and walk with you more nearly, day by day. Amen. So this is a whistle-stop tour through my life and some of the events that have shaped who I am. Um, I was born and spent much of my life in California, spending my growing up years in Southern California, just a little ways north of Los Angeles, near the ocean in a town called Santa Paula. And I was fortunate to be born into a family where going to church, growing in Christian faith was simply what we did, along with my older sister, getting into the family car each Sunday morning and heading to church with our parents was the normal routine. And my mom in particular was a huge influence on my Christian faith and really throughout my life. When I was five years old, uh, we prayed together as I accepted Jesus into my heart. And that I often mark as the beginning of my Christian journey, but it really started well before that. My mom consistently set an example of faithful Christian service. She was involved in youth groups and teaching Sunday school, and right up to the end of her life, my mom was involved in her church's Bible study. Her Christian faith was the core of who she was. And throughout my youth and childhood, I was also really blessed to have a lot of people in the church that I grew up in faithfully teach and encourage me, which led to a solid foundation of knowledge and faith. In my teenage years in particular, I became involved in my church's youth ministry, and I was really fortunate to have a wonderful youth pastor. His name was Byron, and he recognized potential in me that I didn't really see in myself. Um, I remember one Sunday morning, he asked me if I would pray for the offering in our youth um, group service on a Sunday morning. And initially my reaction was, I can't do that. There's other people who should do that. It's not what, something I should do. But then I thought, well, if Byron thinks I can do it, then I guess I can. And his confidence in me was transformative. And I often mark that as what set me on the path towards full-time Christian ministry. As I was finishing high school, I had the opportunity to be an intern for the youth program in my church, and I absolutely loved it. I had a great time investing in the lives of the students, learning about how to do ministry. But at the same time, and this was I did this for two years after I finished high school, I was dead set that I was gonna go to university and study graphic design. And despite a number of people encouraging me to think about ministry, saying to me, but you're really good at this, I had my own plans in mind. And so two years, after two years of being interned there, I set off for university at San Jose State University near San Francisco. And I arrived at uni with a great deal of optimism and excitement, but quickly discovered it wasn't quite what I had expected. And my planned career in graphic design wasn't quite shaping up as the program was extremely competitive. And while I had the passion, I realized my talent didn't quite measure up to that of some of the other people I was in the program with. And I think that God often uses those times when things don't go according to our own plans that we might see as quite brilliant. And that helps us to see his plan. 
And I was in a bit of turmoil as I realized my brilliant plan wasn't going according to the way I had uh, constructed it. But as I prayed and reflected, talked with others, including my youth pastor Byron, my mentor, I began to sense a clear call to full-time ministry. And so from that point on, became um, more involved with youth ministry in my local churches. I felt at that time my call was to youth ministry, I think perhaps because that is what I'd had the most experience of and had a great experience of. And as I did so, I gained an experience, I grew in faith and in confidence. And after I completed university, I moved back home um, in Santa Paula and I began to take classes in theology and look for a post as a youth minister. But once again, things didn't go quite according to my clever plans. One thing that happened is that I began to come up against objections to women in the roles of, in roles of leadership in the church. And that was pretty standard in the American Evangelical Church at that time and really often still today. I remember as a teenager seeing a young man who was a few years older than me. He'd gone off to Bible college and returned um, over one break and announced that he felt called to ordination. And he was brought up to the front of church and prayed for and they patted him on the back. And I remember thinking, it's not how they'd react if I said I wanted to be ordained. So when I began to feel a call to ministry, I had to do my own soul searching and praying and studying the Bible. And I had to look at some of those passages that people use to say that women should not be in roles of leadership in the church and reconcile that with my call. And that's a whole other story. And so I began to see a way forward to fulfill this call that um, I sensed God was leading me toward and to be a minister in light of these scriptures. But I also, at times, really didn't want to battle the system and some of the assumptions. And so over the years, I took on various roles in ministry, both paid and volunteered. But at the same time, I began a corporate career, first in publishing and then in public relations. The sense of call to ministry was still always there, bubbling beneath the surface. Because when God calls you, when it's part of his plan, there's really no getting away from it. And so whilst I was in this time of building my corporate career, I continued to have a number of people encourage and comment on my gifts in ministry, which I was exercising in a volunteer capacity. And I remember having a conversation with one of my pastors saying, I feel God has called me, but I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And he said, can I point out something that I've seen in your life? And he pointed out what he had seen as a pattern of ministry to women, women in that local church and stories I told him about other experiences of mentoring other young women before that. And so from that, I began to research programs at seminaries that offered a focus on pastoral care to women. And so in 2003, I took another leap of faith and I moved to Portland, Oregon. Oregon is a state right above California on the West Coast. And there I began a master's program to obtain a degree focused on pastoral care to women. And to be honest, I think I took this approach because I figured no one could really object to me being a woman in leadership if I were primarily leading other women. And all this time, I was doing my degree part-time. I was also working in a demanding job in public relations and communications. And so I had these two worlds that I was living within. And it took, ended up taking me almost eight times, eight years to complete that degree, which again, was not part of the original plan. But once again, God was in the midst of my disrupted plans. During that time, he began to work on me and show me that his call to my life in ministry went beyond youth ministry, went beyond women's ministry. Those things would be included, but he had a bigger picture for what he wanted me to do. And at this time, I was also deeply involved in my local church. I was being asked to take on more and more responsibility, despite the fact that it was a denomination that didn't ordain women or think they should particularly be in roles of leadership. But we had a new pastor come and he wanted to hire me for a role that was both pastoral, administrative, bringing two of my gifts together. So at his prompting, I wrote my dream job description, which was presented to the leadership of that church and was rejected. It was really deeply painful and difficult. 
I'd been in church. It wasn't a big church. I knew these people well who made the decision that this was not what they wanted for the church. And so shortly after that, I visited England for the first time. So I'm dealing with that experience. And I remember coming to England, to the UK, expecting to find a dead church, much as I had witnessed in other parts of Europe and because that's the narrative in America, just as the narrative here is that America is a very religious country and the, neither of those are entirely true. Because what I saw here in England when I came, it was God had a real surprise in store for me. I was here over three weeks and God took me on a little tour, I think just to show me on what he was doing in the Church of England. And I attended some amazing worship services and had some really significant encounters with God and discovered that this was no dead church. And one of the really important things that I witnessed was female clergy, women who were gifted and encouraged to express those gifts in preaching the word of God, leading services, taking on all the responsibilities of the church leader. Having just been rejected myself for a role in leadership, this was really eye-opening and encouraging. But it wasn't at that time that I thought, ooh, I'm gonna to come to England and serve in the Church of England. When I went back home after those three weeks, I uh, was getting towards the end of my degree and I was doing research trying to find what the opportunities would be to use what all I had learned in my master's degree and to put that into practice. But the more research I did, the less answers I had. And I was lying in bed one night, unable to sleep, honestly feeling quite frustrated and crying out to God. What in the world do you expect me to do with this calling? I know you've called me, but I've searched for the opportunities and I've not found anything. What do I do now? And it was almost as though I heard the audible voice of God. It was so clear. It was not audible, but it was such a clear voice saying, remember what I showed you in England. And in those still small hours of the morning, I thought, okay, Lord, but that's England and I live here. But it was that still small voice in the early hours of that sleepless night that set me on a path to quitting my job, packing up my house, and moving to England to discern whether God was calling me to ordination in the Church of England. So I arrived in England in the autumn of 2013, and for the first year I was in Bristol attending Trinity Theological College, which is affectionately known as a vicar factory, as it is primarily a training college for Church of England vicars. But I was there as an independent student, and there were others like me. And I had an amazing year there, building friendships, learning, and really beginning to explore the path to ordination in the Church of England. And so I was reaching the end of that first year and all the indications from the Lord were, yes, I'm gonna stay in England. I'm gonna to continue to pursue ministry. And so I found a job. I moved to Woodford Green and I took up a post as Director of Operations at All Saints Woodford Wells. And I had another amazing two years there, and I learned so much about ministry and church life. At the same time, I was going through the selection process to be recommended for ordination in the Church of England. It didn't always go smoothly. It didn't always go according to my plan. But in the autumn of 2016, I moved to Durham to attend Cranmer Hall, another one of the vicar factories, this time to become a vicar myself. And it was not an easy year. Because unlike other students who would take two to three years to complete their studies, as an American I was on a visa and that meant I had to complete my studies in just one year. So what other people did in two to three, I had to cram into one. And again, there were many bumps along the road. Things rarely went smoothly. And yet I never lost my sense of calling to ordained ministry in the church of anything. If anything, the confidence in my call only deepened at each challenge that I faced. And so I managed to make my way through that training. I moved to Chigwell in the summer of 2017 to begin my curacy, those three years of continued training that immediately follow ordination in the Church of England. And the challenges kept coming, the disruptions to my plans. A few months into curacy, I needed to apply to have my visa application renewed 
and it was refused. And I ended up back in America for three and a half months while things got sorted out. And it was frustrating. And I just wanted to come home. And I couldn't really understand what God was doing other than to say to me, trust me. And again, I never lost a sense of God's calling on my life to be a minister in the Church of England. The challenges kept popping up, but staying close to Jesus gave me the energy and the power I needed to keep on. So I returned from America. I carried on with my curacy and late last year with the end of my curacy in sight, I began to look around at what the opportunities might be. And I quite quickly came across the parish profile for Raynham and Wennington and my interest was piqued. I was immediately struck by the expression of love for Jesus and the desire to reach the communities of Raynham and Wennington to share that love with them to not just be an insular church, but to reach out to community as well. Now, I'd never been to Raynham or Weddington, so uh, the week before Christmas, I decided to come over and have a look around. And I remember growing more and more excited as I walked around both of the churches and the villages and could see that the churches were positioned in such a way as to be at the center of their communities. And then I came for interview in February and your parish representatives and the other people I had the opportunity to meet did you all proud. And I became even more excited about the possibility of coming to serve as your vicar. And it's been a long time coming. I know for you, it's been a long vacancy. It's been a long time as we have had to delay things due to coronavirus. But at long last, I am here. As you can imagine, that is a somewhat condensed version of my story, but as we get to know one another better, you'll hear more of my story and I'll hear more of yours. But I did want to take just a few moments to share some of the things that I've learned in my personal journey of faith. The first is we all need to cling tightly to Jesus as he holds close to us. Life challenges are going to come. They are inevitable. The Christian life is not a promise of an easy life. If anything, it's just the opposite. But I still believe that following Jesus is the best life that any of us can live. It's the reason that I wanted to be a vicar, to help other people learn how to live a life following Jesus and the joy that comes from that. And I think the other thing is just to remember that God can and will work through all things. And perhaps especially through the hard stuff, perhaps especially through our plans disrupted. We live in a culture that tells us life should be comfortable and easy. And so we often spend a lot of our life, a lot of our energy and our time trying to build a life that insulates us from difficulty. But I've grown the most. I've become closer to God and a person that I am more proud of through the hard things. When I've had to give up my own plans, when I've had to seek God, when I've had to get on my knees, that's when God works. As you heard over and over again, as I shared my story, things do not always go according to my plans. And I'm sure it's the same in your life as well. In fact, I say often things went spectacularly different than the brilliant plans that I'd constructed. My plans to try and protect myself from the hard stuff. But when I keep my eyes fixed on him, I can see how he's at work in the midst of what might initially seem just like chaos, to have no reason. I didn't always understand the why of what I experienced. Sometimes I still don't understand the why, but I can see the way that God can use it to shape me, refine me, make me more like him and help me to trust him more. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors and he said this, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls interruptions are precisely one's real life, the life God is sending day by day. The interruptions, even the unpleasant things, they are part of real life. They are part of what God is sending us day by day. And when we can embrace that and understand that, we can begin to see the way that God is working within the difficult stuff. Sometimes the stuff we want to avoid is exactly what we need. 
so that's a bit about me and my experience. But what's next? You might have questions about what do I have in mind as I become your vicar? Well, from a very early point, I felt that God was saying the first thing we would need to do as a church in this season is to reground and reroute ourselves in the basics of our faith, in prayer and in the Bible. I felt that after a long vacancy and lots of change, it would be helpful to remind ourselves why we do this church thing anyway, why it is that we are Christians, for us to become rooted and established in our faith and love for God once again. And now with what we've experienced with the pandemic, I think that's going to be in a more, even more valuable endeavor. So one of the things I'm planning for us to do as a parish is starting into September to run the prayer course. Prayer is foundational to our lives as Christians. It's how we become rooted and established. It's how we tune our hearts to God and to understand how he's at work. So the prayer course is an eight week course. It's a combination of video and discussion, and we're gonna be creative in how we do it. I anticipate we will likely run it in church, particularly as I know there's some who don't have internet access and couldn't do it that way. We may do it online as well using Zoom or home groups might want to do it themselves. So stay tuned for details on that. And then I'm just gonna spend some time listening and observing. I wanna hear from you. What are your experiences of being part of the churches of Raynham and Wennington? What has been working really well? What are some things that maybe haven't worked so well? Is there something we need to start doing? Are there things we need to stop doing? Obviously the coronavirus and the lockdown means we need to think about everything differently, at least for now. But I believe that gives us an opportunity to reimagine church, to look at things through fresh eyes and to learn again how to be church and how to love one another and our community. So I'm going to continue to do these uh, video sermons over the next few weeks. Um, we'll continue to have a bit of a mixed economy because I think even as we reopen for services, some folks will still be shielding. Some people will not feel quite ready to come out and be in church. So we're gonna offer not just one way to be in church, but some things online as well. There's a lot we don't know about the future, but we can have confidence that none of it is a surprise to God. And as we trust in him and seek to love and serve him as a church, as individuals, we can move forward in confidence. So I thought I would conclude this talk by sharing with you the prayers of intercession that I prayed at my service of institution on Wednesday evening. And although it was a shame we couldn't have a wide invitation for everyone to come due to the restrictions around coronavirus, this is a way to share some of it with you. And we're also hoping to be able to get a video of the service available sometime soon. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we begin this new season of ministry in the parish of Raynham with Wennington, we thank you for the generations of the faithful who have gone before us, worshiping, worshiping you in these churches, and you're proclaiming your gospel to these communities for many years. We thank you for the legacy we have inherited from them, and ask that you would give us the wisdom, strength, and energy to continue to make Jesus known in Raynham and Wennington. Almighty God, I thank you for the work of so many over the extended vacancy. The church wardens, David and Jan, the ship team, Alan, our vergers, service leaders, preachers, small group leaders, and so many others who have continued to faithfully serve in these parishes. I ask that you would bless them and sustain them as we continue to work together to create plans to restart church services to determine the best programs to invest time and energy into, and to seek how to best serve our community. Give us wisdom and guide our decision-making for both the short and the long term. As I begin my role as the vicar of this parish, grant the grace and wisdom I need to lead well. Help me to continually proclaim the good news of the kingdom, helping people to find new life in Christ. Grant me insight as I teach, 
baptize and nurture new believers and encourage all to grow into a mature faith in you. Help me to see the opportunities for this parish to meet human need by loving service and wisely steward the energies, funds, and resources you have blessed us with. Enable me to be sensitive to the ways that we as a community of Christ can work to transform unjust structures of society with compassion and courage. Help us all to see how we can strive to safeguard the integrity of creation, sustaining and renewing the life of the earth. Loving Lord, as we together navigate this season of challenge and opportunity, particularly as we seek to reimagine how we live and worship as a church in the light of the coronavirus pandemic. Enable us to be creative, flexible, and wise. We ask for your presence in the dreams we dare to dream, in the hopes we begin to build, and the future we begin to plan. Help us to recognize the leading of your Holy Spirit as we begin to gather in our churches for worship again and look for creative ways to equip this worshiping community to grow in personal faith in order to be ready to love and serve those around us. Help us to be sensitive to the needs of a hurting world and to welcome them into our spaces and our worship to share your love and acceptance. Almighty God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, grant us amidst the conflicts and challenges of this world the comfort of a perfect trust in you. We ask for your protection over all your people. We ask that you would restrain this virus, bring healing to all those who contract it, and give strength to all those working in health care at this time. We pray for all those working to address the issues of racial injustice in our world, and that you would help us as a church to know how we can be a voice for change and justice to make your place, a, your church, a place where all people feel welcomed, included, and valued. Lord Jesus, as you told your disciples and as you tell us, the world will know that we are Christians by our love for one another. Help us to love one another well for the glory of your kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as our Savior has taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So that's all for today. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person, look forward to worshiping together again, but in the meantime we'll use the tools that we have to connect with one another. Um, so look forward to hearing from you and seeing you soon. God bless. <music>